I'm Amber Hunt, and this is Accused, the Unsolved Murderer of Elizabeth Andes. On the last episode... It would make sense to me that he would want to be there. It would not make sense to me that Beth would have invited that. And you spent a couple hours with her the night before, though, right? Yes, I did. What What was that about? He was just, just talking hanging out. Good about her move and everything. That was it. I was surprised that she asked me to come over. Something happens when you start looking at everyone through a veil of suspicion. The world becomes a pretty dark place. It's 3.20 in the morning. I'm whispering because my house is asleep. I'm up doing work on this case because I just woke up with a jolt. I'm not being dramatic. Woke up with a jolt. Uh, Yelling, help. (laughs) And my husband had to calm me down a little bit and uh, then I couldn't fall back asleep. This wasn't the only time that happened and it was about more than Beth Andy's murder. In researching this case, I heard the same refrain over and over again from some of Beth's friends. They could envision just three possible scenarios in terms of who killed Beth. That it was Bob and he snapped and their trust in their friend has been misplaced all these years. Or it was someone who knew and liked Beth but got shot down when he made a pass at her and he's the one who snapped. Or, as Sue Parmalee put it, It's some crazy guy. I don't think he really knew Beth. He might have seen her, might have watched her, he might have known nobody was in the apartments, he might have done a lot of things and just been one of those crazy people like Silence of the Lamb that come out and murder people. And if that's the case, he's probably done it again. Police look first at those closest to the victims because in most cases, that's where they find the culprits. But not always. Until we know who did this for sure, we can't rule out that it was one of the many serial killers making headlines in 1978. R.J. Valella, for example is still one of the only friends of Beth's I could find who feels Bob was a warranted suspect. His only alternate theory is that the killing was random. I've come to the conclusion it either had to be him or some crazy blowing through town, uh, some sort of crazy serial killer blowing through town, and since there has never been any other murders quite like that in Oxford, I, I, I suspect it was him now. With this episode, we'll explore that avenue. What if Beth Andes was killed by a stranger? There was an unnerving amount of that going on in 1978, after all. In the 70s, there was a certain kind of killer who had the skill to get away with murder long enough to assemble a body count where they would be classified as a serial killer. In Los Angeles, a killer the police are calling the Hillside Strangler has murdered 10 young women and left their bodies on the hillsides along the highways. January 1978 was a black month for the historic city of Sacramento. Chase's series of brutal and seemingly motiveless murders held the city in the grip of fear. Ted Bundy left his Pensacola jail cell twice yesterday. This was filmed after he'd been fingerprinted and photographed for Tallahassee detectives. His attorneys decided against asking for his release on bond. The killer has struck six times since last summer and five are dead. Most of them pretty young women shot at close range on the sidewalk or in parked cars. In researching Beth's murder, I camped out for a while at the Dayton Genealogical Society to dig up all the stories I could find about the case. It was eye-opening for me because I got to see what other grisly and horrifying headlines shared newsprint with Beth's story. My life overlaps with Beth's only by a few months. So aside from what I learned in history class and some documentaries, I really didn't grasp how unsettling a time it was. On the very same day Ohio reporters were writing about Beth Andes, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, was making nationwide news as police uncovered the dead bodies of dozens of young men buried under his home near Chicago. 
Ted Bundy, one of the most prolific serial killers in American history, had recently been arrested in Florida and was readying for trial. A month before Beth died, 900 people drank cyanide in a mass suicide in Jonestown. David Berkowitz had been ID'd as son of Sam, though then he was more commonly called the 44 killer in New York. Police in California were still baffled by the two hillside stranglers. I set the stage because of something a friend said when I told her about Beth's case early on in my reporting. I described how Beth's door showed no signs of forced entry and explained that that's why police thought she must have known her killer. My friend shrugged this off. It was a safer time back then, she said. Maybe Beth just didn't choose to lock her door. It's easy to look back at any period through rose-colored glasses, but that would be a mistake. So we have this um, peak of serial uh, homicide in, in, in the 70s. Um, something like uh, at least 75% of serial killers, all known serial killers, make their appearance approximately between 1970 and 2000 in that 30-year period. That's author and investigative historian Peter Vronsky. He's written several books about serial killers, including Serial Killers, The Method and Madness of Monsters. I thought maybe it was my imagination that there seemed to be an awful lot of serial killers in the late 70s. But no, Vronsky says it's absolutely true. As an aside, he has a theory as to why. It it occurs to me that serial killers, um, their psychopathology is formed when they're children sometimes as early as when they're five years old. Uh, And they kill for the first time, on average, approximately the age of 28. And and so that makes me think, well, wait a minute. We shouldn't be looking at the same period in which the homicides are occurring or increasing. We should back it up 28 years to 30 years. Uh, And once you do that suddenly you begin to see that most of these peak period serial killers, what we call the epidemic years, uh, were actually born or raised in the 1940s, 1950s. Um, so that suggests that if, if, you know, if serial killers are, are a kind of partly a product of parenting, partly a product of their... Um, childhoods, then we have to look at what was happening in the 40s and the 50s. And, and the, my suspicions are, is, is, of course, the Second World War had a tremendous impact on the men who were raising children in that period, that you had a whole generation of traumatized uh, former GIs raising, you know, raising kids in that period, that there's something to do with, with that era. That's maybe a whole separate podcast, so we'll move on. Up until this point, we've talked about people in Beth's life who maybe were deserving of a bit more scrutiny back when she died. Statistically, it is far likelier that whoever killed Beth knew her. Every year, the FBI compiles crime data that supports this. I don't want to dwell on numbers too long, but they're important, so I'll make this as painless as possible using 2014 numbers, which are the most recent available. There were nearly 12,000 murders, of which police said they knew who committed about 6,500 of them. That means in about 78% of cases with a known killer, that killer was believed to be a husband, a wife, a sibling, a boss, or at least an acquaintance of the victim. In just 21% of the cases with a known perpetrator, that perp was a stranger. Bureau of Justice Statistics show that the numbers in 78 were similar with about an 80-20 split between known killers and strangers in cases where the killer had been identified. It's because of that that some of the people we've reached in Beth's case have even agreed. Yeah, in hindsight, it's crazy I wasn't more thoroughly vetted. That's what John Shea said. He's the fourth roommate we discovered who lived with Beth, Bob, and Sue, but was never interviewed by police. Sounds like you know, now that I think of it, you know, really there's there's a lot of missing pieces that weren't followed up on, and I'm probably one of them, you know, it's like, it's kind of weird that somebody that would have lived there never been asked question one. 
But that's not the only angle they didn't question. As statistically unlikely as it is, there is also the unsettling possibility that Beth Andes was killed by someone who didn't know her. And if Beth's killer happens to fall into that category, it becomes more possible that whoever killed her went on to kill others, which, by the FBI's definition, would make him a serial killer. This is where my nightmares begin. You'll need to listen closely for just a minute. If you can, can you hear that? I can hear it, yeah. Okay. I just wrote, I just said that the Hawkins girl's head was severed and taken up the road about 25 to 50 yards and buried in a location about 10 yards west of the road on a rocky hillside. Did you hear that? Mm-hmm. If you had trouble hearing that, it was Ted Bundy describing how he severed a woman's head and took it up the road to bury it on a rocky hillside. This creepy, whispered confession came just days before he was killed in Florida's electric chair. I play it because every time I think about Beth's case, I think about Bundy. Not because there's any chance Bundy's involved. He had been in jail for 10 months when she died. But I think of him because he represents how it actually is possible for a murder that looks like a crime of passion to really have been committed by a complete stranger. Bundy is proof. Serial killers tend to attack people on the outskirts of society. Prostitutes, runaways, homeless people. Bundy didn't. He liked college girls like Beth. Yeah, it's far more likely Beth was killed by someone she knew. But here's a funny thing about statistics. The same ones apply to every one of Bundy's victims as well, including Georgianne Hawkins. She was walking from her boyfriend's dorm to her sorority house in June 1974 in Seattle, Washington. It was a 90-foot walk. 50 feet of that walk is accounted for by witnesses, people who saw Georgianne walking, people who waved at her and shouted hello. But in the 40 feet that her path was covered by shadows, she disappeared completely. Her fate wasn't known until 15 years later, when Bundy whispered his confession to an investigator. This was the reality of the 1970s, though the police didn't really know it yet. And it's only in the, uh, you know, in the 1970s that we uh, begin to suddenly see this, this dramatic rise in these unsolved homicides that seem similar, could potentially be linked together. Um, you know, Ted Bundy's kind of our our archetypical modern or postmodern serial killer. Uh, and, and as we begin to now link these homicides together to single individuals, the term serial killer emerges. Because we never even had, we never used that term. Um, you know, people in the FBI, the uh, police community, they, amongst themselves, proposed the term serial killer, but it was not a broadly used or understood uh, term. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't appear in the New York Times until 1981. March of 81 is the first time kind of the serial murderer construct is introduced to the public in, in general, as applied so to wait, Wayne Williams in Atlanta. And what do, they, what do they call it before that? Well, they called them mass killers. They called them recreational killers. They called it uh, stranger-on-stranger killing, thrill killing. Um, there was a multiple killing. So there, were, there was a whole variety of, 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 of words, but there was no specific definition of what it is. And, and, and the other thing, of course, we didn't have is um, the FBI only starts interviewing multiple uh, you know, sexual killers again, in the late 70s, early 80s. So we don't get that book uh, until very late in the 80s, Sexual Homicide, uh, which is essentially, you know, motives and patterns in sexual homicide, uh, which essentially gives us that definition of, you know, organized killer, disorganized killer, or mixed category killer. Uh, so, so there was no systematic approach there was no diagnosis of the disease. It was this mysterious phenomenon, but we didn't give it any parameters. We didn't understand what it was. Because so it wasn't off- around enough to warrant the parameters, right? Well, it was around, but we just didn't recognize it. 
nobody really thought it through. To local cops, it started to feel like hell on earth. Frank Smith is a retired Butler County homicide detective. He remembers well what things were like for him in the late 70s. What you have to remember in the history of Cincinnati, when all this was starting down there, when we were starting getting these bodies dropped up here, you know, we had at the time the Cincinnati Strangler, you know, had killed numerous women down there. We also had other copycats that were killing women. And at that given time, you know, then we started getting several bodies dropped up here. Uh, we actually had uh, uh, one person that was dropped up here uh, by the name of Cindy Burline. And she was uh, actually dropped in 1974. And she was dropped probably within a quarter of a mile where Nancy Theobald was found, okay? And, you know, you would have assumed that, well, you know, hey, the killer has struck again and dropped in the same location. But it come to find out that it was two different separate cases altogether. Jeez. We had uh, a guy by the name of... Uh, at the time, James Kraft, who was a member of the Outlaw Motorcycle Club, and he was he had grabbed Burline off of the street in Hamilton, killed her, and dropped her out there. And then also at the same time, we had a school teacher who was brutally killed right up the road from that. That turned out to be another serial killer by the name of Donald Corn. So you can just imagine everything that was going on in the 70s and the early 80s in this county. Yeah, so that's going on in this county, and then you've got John Wayne Gacy's property being uh, excavated at the same time, and then you've got Ted Bundy on trial. This it sounds like a charming time. It was a it was a very difficult time uh, for the uh, sheriff's department down here, uh, and you know almost all the cases were solved, convictions were obtained. Uh, you know some of the cases were not. And, uh, you know, they still are open. The Sheriff's Department still does the cold cases. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day, you know, somebody might step forth. It's hard to say. You know, stranger things have happened. As an Ohio transplant, I hadn't heard of the Cincinnati Strangler before, though some of my colleagues had written about his failed appeal attempts. Postiel Lasky Jr. was tied to seven deaths in the mid-60s, He's been in prison since 1967. He's not a question mark here. But there are unsolved murders lingering in Butler County, Ohio, from the late 70s and early 80s. Murders that pro bono lawyer Deb Lydon suspects might be connected to Beth's. Those cases are the reason I reached out to Smith. On October 31, 1976, a man walking his dog found the nude body of 24-year-old Victoria Hincher dumped in a wooded area along New London Road. She'd been missing for 11 days, and the coroner would determine that she had died by strangulation about five days earlier. There were signs of a possible sexual assault. The following December, a Union Township farmer found a clothed body of 18-year-old Nancy Ann Theobald in a creek bed about a quarter mile from his house. The University of Cincinnati freshman was frozen into the mud and had to be dug out. Like Victoria, she'd been strangled. Police at the time would immediately connect the two to nearly a dozen other slangs of young women, starting in 1975 and throughout the Tri-County region. Within a few years, they backed off the idea that all the killings were linked as rape suspect Larry Ralston confessed to assaulting and killing five of the young women in 76 and 77. Nancy Ann and Victoria's cases weren't among those. They remain unsolved today. So does Tammy Lynn Kings. Tammy was five months pregnant when her nude body was found in a Butler County wooded field, November 13, 1982. She left behind a five-year-old son. The similarities between the three unsolved Butler County cases, that's Nancy Ann Theobald, Victoria Hincher, and Tammy Lynn King, for a while led police to believe that they were all the work of the same sick mind. Authorities took that theory to the press in 2000, and the Cincinnati Enquirer ran a couple of stories suggesting that these three women maybe shared a killer. 
But as time marched on, even that theory has changed. In the early aughts, Smith was the face of the county's efforts to retackle cold cases. That effort led him to learn more about a serial killer named Nolan Ray George. Nolan Ray George uh, was a basically a Cincinnati, uh, Hamilton, Kentucky area guy, okay? Uh, extremely smooth, uh, sort of actually a good-looking guy, a guy that you honestly, uh, if you talk to him at all, you would have to just really, you would have to like him. You would really would have to like him. Very smooth. Uh, I mean, if you met him today, it would be yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Um, and, I mean, you can't, you couldn't help but like the guy. He just, he's very polite. Uh, his yeah. appearance is uh, extremely impeccable. Um, but deep down inside, you know, this guy is a stone-cold killer. And his whereabouts are unaccounted for at the time Beth was murdered. Here's George's backstory. In 1969, he was convicted of killing 22-year-old Francis Brown of Lake Orion, Michigan, after his fingerprints were found on a beer can near the body. He served 22 years and then got out and killed again. This time, his victim was 22-year-old Cindy Garland Rose in Butler County. Her nude body was found near Princeton Road in the Ohio 4 bypass on October 23, 1982. Now, if you just did the math, you're probably thinking, why are we talking about this guy in relation to Beth Andes? Wasn't he in prison in December 1978? Yeah, that's what I thought at first, too, But then my producer, Amanda, found a tiny three-paragraph newspaper story dated November 13, 1978. The headline read, Two Murder Convicts Flee Jackson Clinic. Yep, one of them was Nolan Ray George. He and a buddy climbed a fence to freedom. According to the Michigan Department of Corrections, he was recaptured in late January 1979 near Chicago. So there's this six-week window unaccounted for, and Beth's murder happens to fall smack dab in the middle of the window. Seems unlikely, right? Yeah, I know. And there are elements that don't seem to fit. Like that George isn't thought to have stabbed anyone else, only strangled. And his M.O. seemed to usually be to dump the bodies, not to leave them in their own apartment. It could be a long shot, but there's something about George that's unsettling. He sure seems to have luck on his side an awful lot. For example, his first conviction was supposed to land him in prison for life, but a Michigan appeals court threw it out, leading to a plea deal that let George walk far sooner. And he somehow managed to avoid any charges for having escaped that Jackson prison in 78. While his cohort was convicted of fleeing and eluding, nothing of the sort mars George's official record. So some three years after his prison bust, he was released again, and he killed again, this time in Butler County, Ohio. And then, another stroke of luck. George was convicted in that case not of murder, but of involuntary manslaughter. That's because he apparently assaulted Cindy Rose and bashed in her head, leaving her to die in a field in 20-degree temperatures, but the autopsy showed that she died of exposure, not the head injury. So while prosecutors sought an aggravated murder charge, a grand jury indicted him instead on the lesser manslaughter charge. This floored me. So she's dumped in a field, but because the the elements killed her instead of somehow that resulted in a lesser sentence. How does that work? It did. He wouldn't have been uh, in the field if he hadn't. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir there, but I'm like, how does that happen? Right, I totally uh, 100% agree. The stars have a line more than once for Nolan George. After that Ohio prison stint, he took a job mowing lawns in the village of Amelia, about a 30-minute drive southwest of Cincinnati. Then Michigan officials came calling once more, determined to show George that his luck had run out. He was their prime suspect in another cold murder case, that of 36-year-old Gwendolyn Perry. She had been strangled with her own pantyhose in 1968, This caught my attention because Beth had been tied up with things found around her place, too. George had confessed years earlier, thinking he'd get immunity. He didn't and was finally sentenced to life in prison. 
More than one investigator I've talked with in Beth's case said they'd like to know more about George's whereabouts in his 78 escape before ruling him out as a killer. As unlikely as it is that he or any serial killer is involved, doesn't it seem smart to check it out first? Here's lawyer Deb Lydon. It just was shocking to me that no one looked at whether the same person who killed Beth Andes might have been the one who killed the two women in 1976 and 1977. Um, the Andes family had no idea about those other murders, were never told anything about those murders. They had happened in the same time of year. Um, and therefore, it looked as if this very well could have been a serial killer who was involved in all three of them. No one has ever asked Nolan George if he knows anything about Beth Andy's murder. I asked Frank Smith to explain why. My own personal opinion, this is not based on upon anything else, uh, Nolan Ray George would not even be a suspect in that case. It doesn't even come close to his M.O. Okay, so explain to me. Awesome. So can you tell me um, why? Because how how are the M.O.s different? Well, Nolan Ray George's um, M.O. was the same on every homicide that he was ever convicted of and or ever even suspected in, you know. His M.O. was very much the same. It was all alcohol-induced, usually by both parties. Uh, the female was either met at a, a bar or another location and accepted a ride. Uh, alcohol was involved. And then the most important thing, the strangulation was always his method. Right. Okay, even the cases that you have in Pontiac up there and the cases that we have down here, uh, you know, um, he's obviously, uh, you know, strangled everybody. So uh, the other typically would go up to somebody's home and, it, and it wouldn't have enter happened. the home. Okay. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened uh, with that particular case. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, she was found in her bed, uh, multiple stab wounds, okay? And absolutely, that is not his M.O., He's convincing. He really is. So that might be that. But when I asked Vronsky, the investigative historian, whether MOs can change, he offered some insight. So the MO is always changing. Serial killers, um, you know, they learn. Uh, oh, don't stab a person in the front because you'll get blood splashed on you. So next time they're going to stab the person in the back, right? Um, you know, uh, if you're going to break a window, tape the window before you break it, so the gla- you don't hear the glass falling, you know, cause, because a window breaking doesn't make that much noise. It's the glass falling to, to the floor. So all that is MO, and it's constantly improving uh, with the experience of the criminal. Um, the signature will always be the same. The signature is what the criminal does not need to do to achieve his crime. Uh, he doesn't need to stab a victim 95 times in, in, in the breast, say. He needs to do that. He, he's compelled to do that. It's not necessary. I'm trying to keep an open mind here. It seems to me that closed minds are what caused this case to go stagnant all these years, and I don't want to fall into the same trap. Besides, who knows how being locked up for nine years would have affected George's typical routine. Sometimes things don't go as planned. In researching Dennis Rader, who dubbed himself BTK, bind them, torture them, kill them, I learned that just one of his 10 murders went the way he had hoped. In the others, he had to improvise on the spot. With Bundy, sometimes he bludgeoned, sometimes he strangled. Some bodies were left in their own beds after he attacked in the night. Others were dismembered, their body parts hidden. If it weren't for Bundy's own confession on the eve of his execution, Several killings now attributed to him would still be considered unsolved. If I have a case where uh, a woman, the apparently the stabbing was not necessary because the strangulation was enough. If that happens, does that mean that I should only be looking at somebody who likes to stab after they strangle, or can it change up? It it well you, you know it it. If we go again back to Jack the Ripper case, right? He first strangled his victims to disable them. 
and then he stabbed him. And and so the stabbing is he did, he didn't you know if he needed to kill his victim he didn't need to stab them he already strangled them. Right? right. So for him it was all about the stabbing. He needed to strangle his victim in order that he could stab them as much as he wanted to. So um you know exactly uh you're looking for someone who maybe strang- maybe strangled the victim to disable them but for them the intention is really all about the stabbing right um it's called peakerism there's there's it's a very common disorder among serial killers the need to what essentially they're doing is they're substituting um a knife for their penis and so they penetrate the victim with the knife um, and they derive the pleasure from the smell of the blood, from the feel of the blood, from uh, stabbing into the victim's body. But you don't need to stab someone 95 times. You only need one stab. Right. right. So um, in, certainly in the case of Jack the Ripper, um, the strangulation of his victims was the M.O. The stabbing and mutilation was the signature. Okay. The signature is usually the tell. The signature is the tell. So are my nightmares starting to make a little more sense? I've been immersed in this every workday and sometimes beyond for months. There's one more reason I'm slightly cautious about Smith's dismissal of Nolan George. And that's because Smith acknowledged a little bias of his when I told him I was working on the Beth Andes case. He remembered it right away, and he remembered that his mentor in polygraphy, Richard Carpenter, was the man who got the confession. Because of that, Smith thinks Bob Young is the most likely culprit. I gotta say, Dick Carpenter, uh, Lieutenant, uh, he was a uh, very religious, honorable man, black and white. Uh, There was no gray area with him. It was either right or it was wrong. Uh, I know that case troubled him to the the day he died. I spoke with him just a month before he passed. Is it is it possible though that you know that he got it wrong? Uh, my own personal opinion, I don't think so. From what he told me, I don't think so. I admit that I worry about people who say someone they respect can't have made a mistake. Even the best of us are wrong sometimes, so I just keep a guard up. Now, to use a little police lingo, while Smith doesn't like Nolan Ray George for Beth Andes, he does like him for the 1982 Tammy Lynn King murder. It was close enough in M.O. and location to seem a plausible follow-up to his convicted killing of Cindy Rose Garland. As far as Smith is concerned... Uh, In fact, uh, you know, my own personal opinion is he probably did kill Tammy King. Police don't seem interested in questioning him about this case, but I am. I reached out to Nolan George, who's serving a life sentence at Lakeland Correctional Institute in Michigan, to ask if he'd fill me in on where he had gone during that two-month prison break. So far, he's declined two interview requests. I can only hope that someone with more legal authority than I have will someday try to figure out where he was in December 1978. Nolan Ray George isn't the only serial killer in Ohio whose M.O. aligns enough with this case that he's worth a closer look. Though trying to narrow down which deserves real scrutiny is incredibly daunting. There's Edward Wayne Edwards, who died in 2011. He was in his 70s before his first murder was pinned on him in 2009. He's thought to have killed at least five people, including one in Ohio. And one true crime author who's researched him told me in an email that Edwards liked to set up his crime scene so that someone else would take the fall. That sounded familiar to me. I forwarded that author the so-called addict letter that claims responsibility for Beth's murder, and he said, yep, it looks like one of Edwards' typewritten letters to throw off police. So I started to weigh Edwards pretty heavily. But then, maybe unfairly, I got disillusioned by my source. To hear that guy tell it, Edwards was the Zodiac killer in the 60s in California, JonBenet Ramsey's killer in 96 in Colorado, and even Teresa Hallback's killer in 2005. That's the case the Netflix documentary Making a Murderer is centered on. It starts to make the sky sound like something of a magic bullet, just too neat and tidy and convenient. 
Not that it is impossible. This guy is cold and calculated. Listen to how casually Edwards describes visiting the corpse of one of his victims. The one time was about a year later when I went up to check on it. The head had been separated from the body through the animals and everything. And uh, I took it with me and took it across the street and threw it up into the field. And the police and everything, they've been looking for it, but they can't find it. It was nothing but the skull. I do wonder about Edwards, but if it were him, I don't know yet how to go about proving it. Another serial killer who's caught my attention is Glenn Edward Rogers, a Hamilton-born man who earned the nicknames the Casanova Killer and the Cross Country Killer. He's on death row in Florida, convicted of two murders and suspected of more, having supposedly told his family that he had killed more than 55 people by the mid-1990s. If his name sounds familiar, it might be because he was the focus of a 2012 TV documentary called My Brother the Serial Killer, which made headlines because Roger's brother Clay posited that Glenn was the real killer of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. First, the traits that make Rogers possible. He was from Butler County, and both strangling and stabbing were allegedly in his repertoire. He was said to attack women, and occasionally men, while he worked at county fairs and carnivals that traveled across the country. But there are elements that don't fit, too. Rogers was born in 1962, so he would have been 16 when Beth Andes died. As Vronsky told me, the average starting age for serial killers is 28. There are, of course, outliers. I wrote Rogers on Florida's death row and got a reply letter dated July 17th. He wrote, quote, Thank you for asking about the 1978 case. There are so many cases it's assumed I did and closed by the police. I've always been open to be asked about a case. You're the first. Thank you for that. End quote. He asked me to send condolences to the victim's family, but said apologetically that he didn't kill their loved one. Quote, I wish I could put an end to their 40 years of hell. End quote. Then he provided a detailed outline of his actions from 1977 to early 79, complete with his addresses and reform school stints and the name of his probation officer. He became a father for the first time at age 16, months after his pregnant girlfriend had moved in. He and that woman bought their first car, a yellow 69 Mustang, in September 1978, with the money Rogers said he earned working two jobs as a YMCA maintenance man and an office cleaner. Rogers acknowledged that his memory has generally faded over the years, but he wrote that, quote, 1978, I remember well, end quote. Whether he's trustworthy is another matter, but I figure asking is at least a start. These are just some of the known serial killers I've weighed in Beth's case. To be honest, this line of thinking is exhausting. Every time a new name pops up, it requires research and newspaper dives and interviews with folks who knew the killer's patterns. When a book exists, I've read the book. It feels never-ending. Police do have a shortcut they can use, though. It's called VICAP, which stands for Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. It's one of the few positive things that came from Bundy's reign of terror, says historian Peter Vronsky. VICAP was prompted by a double thing, you know, certainly by the rise in homicides, uh, by this fear that there was like an epidemic of homicides, and and, and the lack of coordination, because Bundy killed, I think, in five different states, uh, the lack of inability of police, say, in Utah, in Colorado, in Washington, and in Oregon, to compare each other's crimes and even know that similar, you know, that a Volkswagen was involved, that a guy with a cast was seen, all those right. things. Uh, every single jurisdiction had had no way of looking up if, if it was if the similar things were appearing in the next jurisdiction. You know, it was called linkage blindness. They couldn't link these cases. So every jurisdiction was ignorant of the other jurisdiction's crime. So everybody was on their own. You had five different investigations underway looking for the same guy, but for all different crimes. None of them were able to compare their notes. So that kind of triggered the urgency of, 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 of VICAP. 
In other words, the reason serial killers get away with murder for as long as they do is because a lot of them keep moving around. Police agencies often aren't great at sharing information. Sometimes trends get overlooked. Bundy stymied police by hopping from Seattle to Salt Lake City. That's what provided the catalyst for this national system, which is free for all police agencies. Here's Dan Vogel, the former FBI agent, explaining how VICAP works. It links cases, uh, similar cases, and then it will print out, uh, say, three or four cases that it finds that are, that are close. And then a human being will look at those and say, OK, you know, is the computer right or is this just, uh, you know, is this just a mistake? And if, if it looks like the computer is right, then what they will do is they will contact the police departments and they will say, look, here's two other cases that we found or three other cases that we found that we think are very similar to yours, we suggest you get in touch with these police officers and arrange for a meeting to discuss this because we think the same guy may have been involved. And, of course, that would have helped to stop Ted Bundy because we didn't have VICAP at the time that Bundy was operating. The program focuses on homicides and attempted homicides, either solved or unsolved, as well as missing people, unidentified bodies, and sex offenses. Law enforcement agents can enter the details of each crime to see if others with similar patterns pop up. It's a pretty complicated form, and each category you fill in seems to have a million subheads. Like in one area, it asks for crime types and or motives, and you can choose drive-by shooting, drug-related, revenge, witness elimination, murder-suicide, sexual motivation. That's not even half the options, and you're supposed to choose all that could apply. The victim information also gets incredibly detailed. Did the victim have buck teeth or crooked teeth or an overbite or gaps? Was he a gambler, a gang member, or a loner or promiscuous? Did his lifestyle seem to be a contributing factor in the crime? What articles were used to bind the victim? Were any body parts removed? What was the dismemberment method? What type of trauma was inflicted? Were there any foreign objects inserted into any orifices? And if so, what object and what orifice? If it sounds like a time-consuming form to fill, it is. Yeah, it is. It's a great resource, but again, a lot of police don't use it because it's uh, it's just time-consuming, and they just don't want to fill out more paperwork, and so they just don't do it. And of course, they, it's totally voluntary. You don't have to do it. There's no requirement or law says you have to do it. We just we make it available to the police for you know if they want to use it. And they also have some similar systems in different regions of the country where they do the same thing, but. That, that was basically set up to stop serial killers and to find them early in their careers. Beth Andy's case wasn't entered for 37 years because police were sure Bob Young killed her and got away with it. So they saw no need to enter the details of the crime into the database to find out if it lined up with other MOs and signatures. If they had, it's possible they would have seen that there are some striking similarities between Beth's murder And another one that's still unsolved that occurred 14 years earlier, to the day, not 30 minutes from Beth's home in northern Ohio. In that case, 16-year-old Beverly Jaros was found in her Garfield Heights home, strangled and then stabbed, just as Beth Andes had been. Beverly was home alone for just a sliver of time, same as Beth. Her clothing had been yanked from her torso, though the coroner determined she hadn't been sexually assaulted. All of this should sound familiar. I forwarded this case to Vogel. This new case you sent me, I immediately thought, you know, this is a signature that this guy leaves at the crime scene. This is his method of operation. So that's why we need to be able to compare these cases nationwide to see, because this case, the case you sent to me, is extremely close to the uh, the, the Beth uh, Andis case. And... Uh, You know, I would want to see, you know, I would want to see those two cases compared to see if there's any kind of, well, there are, there are connections. There's no question about it. You've got, you've got some, when you see similar things like that happening, we immediately think, my gosh, this, this, the police really need to look at this case and see, they need to get in touch with the other investigators and talk about, have a meeting and sit down and talk about this. My producer, Amanda, and I asked Oxford police if they'd put Beth's case into VICAP. After months of badgering, they finally did, just days before we recorded this episode. It's now in the system, awaiting comparison. Vronsky said all it can possibly cost is a little time. 
Is there value in it? The case that I'm working on is in, in VITAP, and a big reason is because they thought they had the right guy. Is there value in putting a case in the VITAP even if you think it might be a one-off as opposed to a serial situation? Oh, absolutely, because you you looking at one case, you can't tell if it's a one-off, right? There's no way looking at a single case. Um, I, I, unless you clearly know who the perpetrator was, you know, a husband shooting a wife, there was an argument, um, then you know, it's a, you know it's a one-off. But if it's an unsolved homicide, um, you don't know whether it's a, it's a one-off or, or not. And, of course, VICAP, if there is some kind of outstanding signature in that particular case, it, it may click with other similar similar cases. So, so, and then all of a sudden... Yeah, things come into focus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so certainly value of 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 adding an old, an old case to to VICAP it may fit into a whole other pattern somewhere. Now that the case is entered, we have to wait to learn the results. In the meantime, we have some other leads to follow. Next time on Accused. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that we would need to try to take this case to a trial at this point, this juncture, in this day and age, we just don't have anymore. That's kind of been passed along to me in bits and pieces. What does that mean, though? Is all the evidence gone? This is a special project from the Cincinnati Enquirer, narrated by Amber Hunt, Produced by Amanda Rossman, edited by Amy Wilson, and engineered by Stephen Baum at Cincinnati Public Radio. Music was composed by Andrew Higley. To look at case documents, photos, videos, and more, visit Cincinnati.com backslash accused podcast. <laughs>